Coming up on this Monday edition of Daybreak, six months into her five-year term, President Park Geun-hye is considered to have brought out some noticeable results on diplomacy and inter-Korean relations, but less so at home, including job growth and social welfare. In a bid to stabilise the housing market amid rising long-term rental prices, the government is expected to announce measures this week that include expanding state funds and housing supply while reducing interest rates for home buyers. Plus, the Syrian government agrees to allow a UN team to investigate the Assad regime's alleged chemical attacks on civilians. Washington, having concluded the attacks did happen, is reportedly looking into a military intervention. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Monday, August 26th. Nam Chi Yusan here in Seoul. We start with a symbolic milestone for South Korean President Park Geun-hye. Sunday marks six months since President Park took office as the country's first female leader. There have been areas the president has been commended on, as well as issues that have stirred up heated debate. Our pres presidential correspondent Oh Jin-ju wraps up President Park's performance so far. More than half of the people here in the nation believe President Park is doing a good job. Her approval rating has steadily increased since her inauguration in February to 54 percent, according to a recent survey released by Gallup Korea on August 16th. President Park's North Korea policy is where she earned the most points during the past six months. She consistently maintained a firm stance against Pyongyang even after the North unilaterally shut down the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex in April. She made it clear that there will be no compromises made on such provocative behavior. Her strategy eventually drew the North back to the negotiating table, which resulted in a joint agreement between the two Koreas, stating there will be no further halts at the business park and the two will work towards globalization of the complex. 저는 이번 합의를 계기로 과거 남북 관계의 잘못된 관행을 바로잡고 상생의 새로운 남북 관계가 시작되기를 바라마지 않습니다. President Park also proved her strength in diplomacy. During the bilateral summits with U.S. President Barack Obama and Chinese President Xi Jinping, President Park was able to secure full support from both countries on her push for a trust-building process with North Korea. However, she saw her lowest approval rating in April in the early weeks after she took office due to botched nominations for key members of her new administration. The tax code overhaul announced earlier this month also faced strong backlash from the opposition party and much of the public that criticized the proposal for increasing the burden on the middle class. The finance ministry quickly put forth a revised version of the tax code proposal, but many experts criticized President Park's economic team for being ignorant on what helps people's livelihoods. The presidential office of Chiang Wei explained that if the first six months were a period to set up the blueprint for the Park administration, it will now speed up its efforts to push ahead with actual measures to revitalize the economy and create more jobs. Oh Jin Chu. News. In another reflection of President Park's principle-oriented North Korea policy, South Korea has said that the prospects for an inter-Korean leaders summit is unlikely at present. Unification Minister Ryu gil told state broadcaster KBS Sunday that issues surrounding the two, Korea two Koreas cannot be substantially dealt with in one stroke. Ryu also stressed that Seoul's economic sanctions on Pyongyang following the North's torpedo attack on the South's warship in 2010 will stay intact until the regime starts taking responsible measures. The minister also said the reopening of the Mount Kumgang resort, suspended after a South Korean tourist was shot dead by a North Korean soldier in 2008, would depend on the North's guarantee of safety of South Korean tourists visiting the resort. 
The South Korean and North Korean Red Cross will start verifying this week whether the applicants for the upcoming inter-Korean family reunions are alive. The reunion of families separated by the Korean War is scheduled to take place starting September 25th. The South Korean Red Cross plans to narrow down the list of randomly selected 500 candidates to anywhere between 200 and 250 in the coming days and confirm the final list of 100 people by September 16th. Meanwhile, the list of candidates from the North will be directly selected by North Korea's ruling Workers' Party. An official at the South Korean Red Cross says with only a month left until the event, the group will proceed with the necessary preparations as soon as possible. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is thought to be preparing to reshuffle his military chiefs after reportedly reaching a conclusion to protect the country's sovereignty and security. Although it did not state exactly what that conclusion is, the North Korean Central News Agency reported that Kim has brought up issues concerning matters related to the organization of the military during a conference with the Central Military Commission. The specific topics of discussion and when or where the conference was held were not stated in the report. But North Korea experts say this may hint at the reorganization of military personnel ahead of one of North Korea's most important holidays, Seonggun Day, which is a day to underscore the country's military first ideology. Turning to the latest on South Korea's multi-billion dollar fighter jet deal, to the surprise of many, all three bidders, Boeing, Lockheed Martin and the European Aeronautic Defense and Space Company have handed in letters of intent to the Korean government late last week in hopes of providing 60 new fighter jets to the country. Lockheed Martin with its F-35A and EADS with its Eurofighter Typhoon which were known to have been cut out of the race due to their staggering prices, also showed their last intent to participate in the project. Only Boeing's F-15 Silent Eagle had met the price range asked by the Korean government during previous biddings. An official at the Defense Acquisition Program Administration says the F-15 Silent Eagle, as of now, will most likely be selected but much controversy is expected if its performance and technology lag behind the other two models. As the nation's housing rental prices keep soaring while the property market remains sluggish, the Korean government has rolled up its sleeves to help citizens afford decent homes. And as the government is expected to announce new measures this week, the housing fund will be expanded and interest rates on housing loans will likely be lowered. Our Han Da-eun tells us more. Amid Korea's ongoing slump in the property market, more and more home buyers are turning to Cheonsae, Korea's unique housing system of lump sum rental deposits, instead of buying their own homes, even if they can afford it. The popularity of long term housing leases have sent Cheonsae prices skyrocketing, and it's no news that an average Korean has to go through extreme difficulties in finding a decent place to live. To ease the burden on its people, the government has stepped in. According to the government's latest report on measures to stabilize the housing market, the National Housing Fund will be expanded, while the interest rate on housing loans will be lowered to encourage more people to buy homes. Currently, a married couple with a combined income of 40,000 U.S. dollars looking to purchase a home that costs less than $270,000 receives government aid of up to $90,000 at an annual interest rate of 4%. Now the government is reviewing ways to expand that support so that married couples with higher incomes can afford to purchase more expensive homes at lower interest rates. Market watchers are welcoming the government's possible new measures, saying that encouraging potential home buyers with purchasing power to buy their homes is the quickest way at this point to revamp the sagging housing market. The government also plans to increase this year's planned supply of Chunze and other housing from the current 36,000 units to much more. Details of the measures will likely be announced Wednesday. Handan, Arirang News. 
Commercial banks here in the nation are planning to reduce recruitment by nearly 30 percent this year as their profits continue to crumble and amid the economic slowdown. Seven banks, including the country's top lender, Kumin Bank, are expected to hire a total of 2,700 employees this year, which is about 1,000 people less than last year. Some banks are even saying they might scrap plans to recruit more workers altogether. The cuts are not just expected in banks either. Insurance, credit card and securities companies, as well as public financial institutions, have announced plans to reduce the number of new recruits this year by up to 50%. New data shows Samsung Electronics was still the number one player in the global television market in the first half of the year. Market research company Display Search says Samsung's flat screen TVs accounted for more than 27 percent of the market, followed by local rival LG Electronics with around 16 percent. Japan's Sony trailed behind with less than 7 percent. What's notable is that Samsung has led the flat screen market for the 30th straight quarter. Samsung and LG are raising the bar even further by releasing curved display OLED TVs. These TVs enable slimmer designs and more vivid images compared with their LCD equivalents that require a backlight. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. The United States seems like it's stepping up preparations for a possible military response to last week's alleged chemical weapons attack in Syria. It called the Syrian government's offer on Sunday to let UN officials review the affected areas was not credible. Our Huang Jie has the details. In a move seen to be stepping closer to possible U.S. military action in Syria, the Obama administration has concluded that the Syrian government probably used chemical weapons against civilians in the suburbs of Damascus last week. A senior official of the U.S. administration said Sunday that President Obama is now weighing how to respond. In an emailed statement, the official called a Syrian promise to allow United Nations officials to inspect the chemical weapons attack sites, quote, too late to be credible. Syria and the U.N. agreed to the inspection starting Monday, five days after the alleged attack. The official made it clear that the Syrian government's move was not enough, adding that if it had nothing to hide, it would have let the U.N. officials inspect the sites right after the attack was first reported. The statement went on to say that evidence could have been destroyed because of constant bombing and the regime's other actions in the area. Around one year ago, President Obama said the use of chemical weapons by Syrian government forces was a, quote, red line, despite mounting criticism from congressional Republicans and others for failing to respond more strongly to the attack, the president has remained reluctant to intervene in another war in the region after two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak appeared in court for his retrial that began on Sunday in Cairo. Mubarak, who is now under house arrest since his release from prison last week, arrived at the court via helicopter in a wheelchair escorted by medical and security personnel. The disgraced leader faces charges of complicity in the killing of about 900 protesters during the revolt against him in 2011 and also a few corruption charges. Charges. His retrial had begun in May but was adjourned several times, prompting criticism from the public that claimed the court was avoiding a verdict. Meanwhile, the trial of three leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood who faced charges of inciting the murder of protesters has been adjourned until October as they were absent for security reasons. 
The 2013 World Rowing Competition has kicked off in Chungju, Central Korea, where hundreds of athletes from around the globe are competing for the world crown. Our Kim Hyun-bin follows report from Chungju. Waving flags and a summer breeze creates a perfect atmosphere for athletes to compete in. On your mark, get set, and off they go. Athletes from all around the globe are competing in the 2013 Chungju World Rowing Competition to find the best of the best, with thousands of spectators worldwide as the judge. The goal is to do as well as my pair partner and I can do in this race. Um, you know, we have individual goals for ourselves, but we'll keep that to ourselves for now. But it's been great coming to Korea. Everyone's been so nice and very helpful. We're excited to get racing started today. Uh, well, my goal of today's race is uh, to qualify for the semifinals. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's great to be here for all the way from Holland. It's a, a beautiful course and everything is so well organized. So. The event hosted by the International Federation of Rowing Association began with the opening ceremony Saturday, while the competition started Sunday. There are 27 different rowing categories, including single and double skull and coax pair, among others. Spectators were pleased to see an international competition being held here in Korea. Korea is hosting the World Rowing Competition, and we live in Cheongju, so we decided to come to learn about rowing. The scenery is great as well as the stadium. Win or lose, athletes and visitors alike will not return home empty-handed taking back memories. Roughly 1,000 athletes from 75 countries will compete in the eight-day extravaganza with hopes of taking home the world's rowing title. Kim Hyun-bin, IDEA News, Chungju. And a good Monday morning to you all. Now, if there's one sport that Korea is consistently good at, it's archery. Now, it's almost scary how good they are. And in fact, going into the fourth World Cup event of the season, they finished off strong and went bling bling. Now, the mixed double pair of Yuno Ki and Lee Sung Yoon won the gold medal, as well as the men's team who beat USA 225 to 196. Meanwhile, the women's side fell just short as the women's team won the silver medal after losing to India 219 to 215 in the finals. And now moving on, they call him Yi Sung Parak over in the Netherlands, but here in Korea, we call him Pak Ji Sung. After making a season debut against AC Milan during the UEFA Champions League playoffs, he went into his first league match against Heracles El Malo. That only took six minutes for the first goal to be scored in the match as Laren Duarte finds the back of the net, giving Heracles the early 1-0 lead. Now time kept ticking and PSV facing a 1-0 upset loss, but in the 86th minute, Pak Ji Sung being Pak Ji Sung somehow pokes this on in the equalizer. As the match finishes off tied 1-1, Pak Ji Sung scores his first goal of the season as he helps PSV run away with the point. Meanwhile, PSV sit in second place with three wins and a draw. And back here in the nation, we have some Sunday's K-League Classic action as the Pohang Steelers squeezed in a win against the Chandam Dragons as they took the match 3-2. Now with the win, Pohang's now five points clear of Chumbuk for the first place lead. Meanwhile, FC Seoul taking on Gyeongnam FC. Both teams do go scoreless in the match as they split a point now tied with Ursan with 42 points. So with that said, let's take a look at the Suwon Samsung Blue Wings taking on Daegu FC. Of course, shifted over to the game, first half of the match, both sides go at it from the start, but they both fail to score as the match goes nil-nil after the first match, uh, first half of the match. Now, second half starts and nothing going despite the aggressive attacks from both sides, but the game changer comes in the 74th minute of the match with Leandro Lima getting the red card here and we have a penalty kick. Now Santos taking the spot kick and he's going to convert it here, 1-0 Suwon. Shortly after that, 79th minute of the match, here's Lee Yong Red this time. For the second goal of the match, Suwon takes a 2 0 lead. Nothing happening after the red card for Tegu as Suwon takes three points here. 2 0, your final score. And moving on to baseball, where LA Dodgers rookie pitcher Ryan Jin after, went after his 13th win of the season against the AL East leaders, the Boston Red Sox. 
and it looks like it's the same problem for Yu Yunjin over and over again. That was the first inning once again as the Dodgers jump all over him from the start, scoring four runs in the inning, including a three-run shot from Johnny Gomez. And despite the bad start, Yu Yunjin settles down, pitching five innings, giving up just the four runs while striking out seven. The Dodgers lineup, meanwhile, unable to read John Lester's pitches as the Red Sox take this game 4-2. As Yu Yunjin is now 12-5 with an ERA of 3.08. And now finishing things off with some Sunday night's KBO action as the Hanwha Eagles sweep the Tucson Bears 3-2. Now Tucson continued to struggle late in August with the SK Wyvern shutting out the NC Dinos 2 to nothing. So with that said, let's take a look at the other two games that took place last night, starting off with the Samsung Lions taking on the Lotte Giants. Of course, shifting off to the game, we go over to the third inning here. Chung Young Shi grounds one to third base. This one, infield single, scores E. Ji Young for the 1 0 Samsung lead. Next inning, Pak Jong Yoon at bat. RBI double to left field as the ball game's now tied 1 to 1. Sixth inning of the game, here's Pak Sung Min sends one to left field. A sack fly gives Samsung the lead once again before Lotte Giants once again. Chan Song Ho ties it up with an RBI single to left. Following inning, Peyong's up at bat, an RBI single here, but an error by the right fielder. Check this out. This is going to bring home Kim Sang Soo, and Samsung now takes the lead 3 2. Next play, here's Cheong Woo, deep to right field here, an RBI double, and it's 4 2 Samsung Lions. Caught in the fence there. Eighth inning, Samsung getting some more insurance runs. This time, Lee Ji Young, an RBI single as Samsung takes the lead 5 2. And that's your final score as Samsung now has a half game lead over the LG Twins. And next up, the next in Hero is taking on the Kia Tigers. First inning, Naji Wan, an RBI single to left field, gives the Kia Tigers the early 1 0 lead. And check this out, Ibo Mohat at bat, drills with the deep center field, back back, Yuan Jun leaps and makes the catch, stealing a home run right there. Meanwhile, bottom of the inning, Kim Min Sung with the bases loaded, two run single as the next in heroes take a 2-1 lead. Shifting to the third inning of the game, Naji Wan, a two run double to deep right field, and this is going to make it 3-2 Kia Tigers. Fifth inning, remember Lee Bum Ho? Well, he's back once again. This time, once again, sending to deep center field. But this time, it is out of here. A three-run shot as the Kia Tigers take a 6-2 lead. Sixth inning, next and making it interesting with Song Ji Man's two-run double to left field and a 6-4 Kia. Ninth inning, Kia up 9-4. Here come the next and heroes once again. Wu Naram here, RBI double cuts the deficit before Pak Pyong Ho sends one to right. A sack fly makes it 9-6. Rally cuts short though as Kia hangs on to take this game 9-6 when next and now trailing Tucson by just a half game. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Happy Monday morning to you. I'm Lee Ji Hyun with your latest weather forecast. So yes, it's getting cooler in the mornings and evenings, but plenty of sunshine in the afternoon is sending temperature to low 30s in most regions. Now, low 30s can be a hit relief for southern provinces, but not for here in the central region. In fact, the heat wave advisory is still in place for some of Gangwon, Gyeonggi, and here in Seoul. So it's going to be a hot afternoon. Also, some of the central inland regions might receive passing showers during the afternoon. Well, right now, we are looking at clear skies with a few low clouds passing by down south. Uh, so we are waking up to mostly to partly sunny skies this morning, and it's likely, likely to be sunny all day long. Well, tomorrow's weather will be very much like today's. We'll have a hot and sunny afternoon. In fact, it will be hot and sunny till the Wednesday, and the rain will strike on Thursday to cool things up. So so these days, it feels nice and breezy when there's no sun, but still scorching hot in the afternoon. So let's take a look at those numbers. Uh, Seoul and Daegu will have the similar readings today. Morning lows in uh, Seoul and Daegu will be the same at 22, and daytime highs will rise to 32 degrees.
temperature Celsius that's 90 degrees in Fahrenheit. And it looks like Gwangju and Busan will hike up to 31 and 30 with lots of sunshine. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like uh, Jeju, Daejeon and Mount Gyeonggang will soar to low 30s, while Dokdo will stay in the late 20s. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me at this hour. Enjoy your morning commute and have a wonderful Monday. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Thank you for being with us.